everybody, this is Perch. Uh, in another video, I uh, I was pointing out kind of this um, this what, what feels to me a very childish, very churlish kind of behavior of people who talk about uh, not being able to get away with the things that creators in the past could get away with, and I, I just find I find it absurd, particularly for an industry where for you know big parts of it they were regulated by this Comics Code Authority. They were uh, there, there's big aspects of where, you know, hands were tied. If you were an indie comic creator in the eighties, you could certainly do things, but you're, you're, you, you were resigned to the fact that your audience was going to be extremely limited. If you didn't get into Marvel or DC, you, uh, you, you could have a career in comics, certainly, but you, you weren't going to get anywhere close to the kind of attention that today's creators with, uh, you know, the variety of, of indie work that gets showcased are able to achieve. So I found the whole statement. I, I just, I still find the whole statement absolutely just ludicrous on the surface. What do you mean you, you can't get away with what these other people uh, got away with? Um, I, I mean, a lot of creators today can't begin to comprehend uh, the amount of restrictions and handcuffs and, and, you know, editorial was a lot more involved and things like continuity turned out mattered and, you know, a, a gym shooter could show up and harass you because you actually, you know, wrote a character out out of <laughs> out of character. Uh, and, you know, today I, that's not happening. I mean, and, and certainly not anywhere close to this level. So I found it absurd. So I, I was talking about this with someone, and um, and they brought up. Uh, it's like, well, you know, basically, I thought it. I thought it. Was, I think it's obvious. You know, they they're not getting the uh, prestige twelve issue maxi series that like Tom King is able to get Tom King's able to get a 12 issue black label kind of thing. You know, where's, uh, where's Danny Lore's 12 issue, uh, series. And I had to like stop for a minute and just like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I think he's correct, but that is the dumbest thing I've ever <laughs> heard. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I just, I'm like, oh God, yeah, idiots. That was, that was what was kind of in my head a little bit because, um, you know, you, you get, you get writers who have, uh, you know, have Substack deals or have advances or have ongoing series or companies are, are falling over themselves to give them various projects. And it's like, well, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the privilege of being offered a Heathcliff ongoing series like, uh, like creators in the past were, I mean, uh, you know, there, there was a. Did you realize there was an Alf series? When, when am I going to get offered to do an Alf series? I, I, it, and so ultimately that bar becomes, unless I'm able to completely do whatever I want, whenever I want, with no guidelines, no restrictions, no nobody, nothing, not, just everything is in my 100% control at all times. Then I don't have it as good as people in the past. That, that's I think really what it comes down to. And, and again, there's some addiction to playing the victim card for certain. For sure. But let me turn this video into something at least a little bit more positive because I, I just, I, the more I think about that, the more it's like brain cancer. I mean, you just can't, just, just, just that's stupid. That's stupid. Again, I think, I think he was right in, <laughs> in saying this is what people are thinking, but it is really stupid. If, uh, if you are currently a writer of multiple ongoing regular series comics, but you feel like, uh, you know, you are not given the same opportunities as, say, Alan Moore has because he at one point got a 12 issue uh, series from DC, which just for what it's worth, uh, DC was not expecting it to do that well. I mean, it, 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 DC was not. Uh, they, they, DC certainly been more than happy to continue to keep it in print and make money off trades. And they, I mean, the DC is not unhappy with where Watchmen wound up, but everything from kind of the deal they originally struck with him to how they marketed at the time, this, DC didn't think this was going to be one of their huge hits. Uh, by the time the series was ending, they were aware and they were marketing the living hell out of it, but that's, that's not how it began. So, you know, for, for whatever it's worth. So what is making it in comics? It became kind of the, the, the this could be the positive question we're going to pull out of this. What's, what's making it? And I think this is really one of those cases where it's going to be in the eye of the beholder. It's going to be unique to some people. It's going to be what, what motivates them. Um, I, uh, I've told this story before. Uh, I had a friend who worked at Microsoft, a tech company, and 
uh, he would get stock because every year you get stock grants and everything else. And this was back in the time when Microsoft stock was splitting uh, every year. And uh, what was interesting is this guy didn't value the stock. The stock was not uh, how he valued self-worth. He valued self-worth by material things, things he could hold. And he said as much. He said that, uh, you know, if I can't hold it in my hands, I don't really feel like it, it means anything. Now, that's a dangerous line of thinking if you're going to be, uh, you know, trying to grow your net worth and other things because stocks and, uh, you know, and financial investments are going to be pretty important to, to growing your overall net worth. And uh, Microsoft stock, uh, as soon as he'd get it, as soon as it would vest, meaning he could then take it and own it and spend it, he would do it. He would immediately cash it out, get the value, and he would run off and buy whatever it happens to be, VCRs, DVD players, um, and you go over to his house and it was filled with crazy gadgets and it was, it was incredible, everything that he had. Uh, but he ultimately was, you know, a lot poorer than the other people who worked with him because they were taking the stock and, you know, saving it and, you know, letting it grow and, and playing the market. And this guy was buying VCRs. And at one point I remember uh, being over at his house and uh, for a party, a bunch of people were there. And he was bragging about how he got this uh, DVD recorder. So it was a DVD player that had two DVD slots, a blank DVD, and you could you copy DVDs, basically, in one recorder. It was, it was like $1,000 because technology was expensive and stupid back then. But anyway, it was a $1,000 DVD recorder. And he talked about buying it two years ago uh, with his stock, with some of his stock. And somebody, some some jackass, because a lot of people who work for Microsoft are jackasses, they, they pulled out a calculator and they're like, hey, that DVD player, uh, if you would have just held on to your stock, uh, that DVD player is actually worth $12,000. So it's a $12,000 DVD player. And it kind of, the dam kind of broke. And so people started kind of mocking this guy with the various things he had around his house and how crazy, uh, you know, how much it was worth if he just kept the stock rather than buy this crap. And it, but it, anyway, it, was, it, it created an interesting argument, but it's always stuck with me because it was an illustration of how people have, you know, observe value, how they basically determine whether they've made it or not. And to some, what, uh, what, me, what is making it doesn't necessarily make logical sense. And I think in comic books, that's a bit of what we've got here. You've got people who are, are currently, I mean, we have comic writers who have three to four ongoing, and I understand that word means absolutely nothing in today's day and age, but ongoing series at both Marvel and DC. And yet, because they haven't been offered what is in their head a prestige product, they're, um, you know, they're not given fair advantages. They're not given fair opportunities. They're uh, being overlooked. Uh, I remember when Bill Willingham, uh, you know, he was going to do some more with Fables, and he had that Batman versus Bigsby book coming out uh, that he was putting, he was doing, and a number of people were like, "Oh, look at this! They would never give me this kind of opportunity." What opportunity exactly? A a limited series? And what it came down to was, it's like, well, look, it's they they, they said it's prestige. It says prestige right there in the solicitation. This is a prestige comic book. And it's a, it's a special event. You know, my comic's not labeled as a special event. It's like, yeah, but your comic is ongoing. Your comic is uh, something that's, uh, you know, that they've, they've contracted for, for more than a year. Most comic writers would give up their arm to have a 12-month commitment of a comic book. Most don't get that. And yet, you're willing to kind of ignore that in favor of what appears to be something prestigious. Look, I, Tom King has this Bat Cat 12 issue maxi series, and that's that's a lot of what he does. He gets these 12 issue series. Supergirl is less, but he gets these, you know, Warshack 12 issues by Tom King. Um, its sales are on the on the low end of what DC is doing right now. It's not doing terribly well. The trade will will sell some copies, but it's it's not like this is on the top of the world. And if you're taking your your you know, the value of, oh, well, Tom King, it says, it says a uh, critically acclaimed author, Tom King is writing Rorschach. And in my comic, it just says, you know, hey, it's Danny Lore's champions. It's like, when are they going to say critically acclaimed 
you know, greater Danny lore. I, it's, it seems like that's uh, that's unfair. I mean, critically acclaimed in a solicitation of uh, the previews catalog is not going to keep you warm at night. That's not going to buy you a car. That's not going to buy you a steak. That's not going to buy you shit, actually. So what what is what does that even mean? It's it's weird to me because you see these comments, you know, crop up from people who have quote unquote made it. Now now granted, another factor in all this is if your page rate is like, you know, 65, 75, 85 dollars a page, uh, that sucks. Uh, but that's going to suck whether you're on an ongoing series, limited series, whether you're labeled as critically acclaimed or Ringo Award winning or whatever, whatever you are. Um, that page rate still blows. So I mean, that the the money that's involved here is the big, <laughs> the big deciding factor of everything. But it it is um, it it's it's amazing to see uh, what people think is valuable in comics, and the fact and and just kind of this continual sense of being overlooked or not getting what's theirs or not getting recognized because they don't have something that many comic writers who have it would would happily trade. There's a lot of writers right now who are on these limited series that are being built up as prestige or a special event or, you know, acclaimed writer, blah, blah, blah. And they would happily trade that for an ongoing contract with anything. And it's, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a grass is always greener on the other side, but it, it is, it is bizarre. I do think it comes down to uh, a fundamental belief that I should be able to write whatever I want, however I want it, at whatever timing or frequency I want it, with whatever artist that I want, and it should sell like the, the biggest comic that's come out that month or that year. And if I don't get all those things, then... Um, you know, then I'm, I'm not being given the same advantages that, you know, Alan Moore had or Grant Morrison had or Frank Miller had. And, and until I get all those things, I, I'm just, uh, you know, it's unfair. The life is working against me. It's crazy. Anyway, um, there, there you go. I, what people find as value is fascinating. And, you know, if you are listening to this right now and you're, you're thinking, you know, what, what, how do I feel value? The, the piece of advice I give you, the dad perch advice I would give you is, you know, value needs to mean something to you, not to how other people perceive you, not to how Twitter perceives you, not to how you can brag to your friends about it. It has to be internal. And generally speaking, uh, before you start throwing rocks at other people for having more than you do, take stock of what you actually have, because many people actually have a pretty good thing going or at least are in a position to you know have a lot of options and they're so fixated on wanting what somebody else has that they are overlooking the fact that their own life is pretty good and in some cases much better for what it's worth thanks for listening